I get to review a fair amount of PCB designs from our community and I've noted a few common design mistakes that keep coming up again and again. Take a look at these two designs for example. What makes the difference between such a design with really clean, short and efficient trace routing versus this other one which is just not as good? But more importantly, how can you avoid these design pitfalls in your design? Stick around because in this video, we'll be talking about tips for PCB layout and component placement so that if you'll be routing your board manually or if you'll be using an outer router, you are not faced with a situation where all your traces are so long they look like spaghetti. Bruh. After watching this video, I guarantee you will approach PCB layout and component placement more deliberately. I'm Collins, I've designed hundreds of PCBs and I think about this stuff all the time. With that said, let's get started. Before we even begin, I just want to emphasize that placement is an iterative process and you're almost always going to have to move or shift a component to make room for another one. One of the biggest mistakes which I was personally doing when beginning PCB design is early optimization. And this is where I will place components somewhat permanently on the PCB and therefore later on it's hard to move those components and adjust them if I want to make room for a more critical component simply because I had spent too much time there. But like I've said, placement is an iterative process. Throughout this video, I'll rely on tools like the rat's nest or air wires to know what components should be connected or placed closer to each other. This will obviously go hand in hand with switching from schematic to PCB views when selecting components. I'll also be using the alignment guides in Flux when I want to make sure the components are nicely aligned with each other. Alright, now let's get started. For real this time. If you have some hard mechanical constraints, a good place to start is defining the board outline and then placing all the mechanical components like connectors or mounting holes as specified by the mechanical engineering team. Then be sure to lock these components in place just to avoid accidentally nudging them while moving other components around because obviously this can create alignment issues down the line. But if you're not working with any sort of physical constraints, I just leave this until I finish the placement, after which I can resize the board to fit the layout neatly. Placement can be made way easier and intuitive if you organize your components into logical sections. Most designs like this one for example can be broken down into functional blocks. I have the power management section here which contains a voltage regulator, a power distribution switch here and a battery charging IC. In the middle, I have the main IC section, which has the main processor, a 12 MHz crystal oscillator, an external flash, and a bunch of uh, decoupling capacitors. I also have the transceiver section, the micro SD, the microphone, and a connector. To group components logically, I'd start by highlighting the middle section in this schematic. Since Flux supports cross-tab selection, Switching over to the PCB tab will automatically have the entire section including the main IC, uh, the decoupling capacitors and related components pre-selected and therefore I can just drag them around. I can then jump back into the schematic tab, select the entire power management section and in the PCB tab, I drag the selection to just isolate it from the rest. Like I said before, you also have this rat's nest or these air wires which will guide you to know which components are to be placed close to each other. And if you wanted to see them clearly, you can turn off this grid or I'll just keep them on. A rule of thumb here is the neater your air wires are, the simpler your routing will be. After the logical grouping, I will start with the centerpiece of this section. And here by centerpiece, I simply mean the component that serves as the main focus of the section and has the most connection to other components in that group. Here this RP2040 is my centerpiece, so I'll just place it somewhere centrally. Other important components in this section include these decoupling capacitors. So I'll start by moving them in place, just somewhere near the IC as an initial rough placement. but 
I have to take care that I don't put it too close to the IC that it later causes assembly issues. Later in this video, we'll talk about how close is too close and we'll cover this with regards to different manufacturers. I can then move to the oscillator. Placing it as close as I possibly can to the IC will help me later on be able to use short traces to make the electrical connections. If you're not sure where to begin, some data sheets will have a section dedicated for the PCB layout guideline of that component, and therefore, you could start them. For example, if I open the data sheet of U3 and scroll to the bottom, there is this PCB layout guide. Here, the manufacturer recommends keeping traces as wide and as short as possible, but you can only achieve this by placing components as close as possible to the main IC. And that is what we're seeing here. Place input and output capacitors as close as possible to the input and output pins to lower the inductive impedance and improve the transient performance. So these are recommendations from the manufacturer. But remember, it all depends with what you're working with and the compromises you have to make. The final tip when it comes to component placement and one which is usually overlooked is using the 3D viewer. This view is generally very useful in making sure the mechanical aspects of your design are consistent with your expectations or requirements. For instance, I can quickly see and confirm that the USB connector is properly aligned with the board edge and positioned to fit nicely into the enclosure cutout. It's a great way to verify the critical components are positioned correctly in relation to mounting holes, edges, and other hardware and therefore ensuring your design is mechanically ready for production. Now that we've covered component placement, let's shift focus to an equally important aspect of PCB design, ensuring your board is manufacturable. Design rules in Flux are created using the rule system. So in this section, we'll cover how to use object-specific rules and selector-based layout rules to enforce design for manufacturing guidelines. These guidelines are typically found on your manufacturer website under the capabilities section and different manufacturers have different capabilities such as minimum trace width, via sizes, spacing requirements and many more. So therefore it's important to either reach out to them or double check from their website. By setting up these constraints in advance, we ensure that when it's time to route the board, we are using the correct design rules that align with the manufacturer's capabilities. Let's start by choosing an appropriate stack-up. The stack-up determines the number of layers, copper thickness, and overall structure of your board. Manufacturers often specify standard stack-up options on their website. So again, consult the capabilities section for details. By default in Flux, you get a four-layer standard stack-up. However, you can always change that by selecting the layout object, going to the object specific rules, and here you can see a bunch of pre-built manufacturer templates to get you up and running quickly. For this project, I'll go with the JLC PCB for layer stackup, which also configures the via sizes to align with the manufacturer's guidelines. Next, we'll configure our preferred trace width. Here we'll ask Copilot to look at all the nets in the design and recommend preferred trace width sufficient for current handling and aligned with the manufacturer's capabilities. For example, I can type in a table format, recommend preferred trace width for the different nets in the project considering JLCPCB's manufacturing capabilities. Copilot will take a minute and then give me those values in a nicely formatted table. To add this into Flux rule system, I first change to the rules tab here, then click add rule set, select the newly added rule set, and on the inspect panel, I want to change the name to preferred trace width. You can add a description there, but I'll just leave it empty and go to the selection criteria. Here I want to target all the nets, and to do that, I just type net. Then finally, you'd click this button to add a new rule that will apply to all the nets. So here I can search for preferred trace width, uh, select it and click add again to add it. You can use these default values 
or the ones Copilot recommended or just put in values that you deem appropriate. Also, remember to add the important flag to ensure this rule takes precedence. If you like an in-depth tutorial on these selector-based layout rules, I've linked some tutorials on the description box below, so check it out. Okay, you could also set the trace width of a particular net or nets to different width. For example, in this project, you can see I have VBAT, VIN, VSolar, and the USB net, which I would maybe like to have wider trace width. So to tell Flux that I want traces in these nets to have a wider trace width, I first go back to the rules tab and add another rule set. I select it and go to the inspect tab where I can change the name to something like power trace width. For the selection criteria, I'll type in this selector. And this selector will target all the nets with the keyword in in them. And this will make sure I select all the nets that I want. And then add a new rule called trace width and change the default value from 10 to 20 mils so that when I begin routing or if I'm using an auto router, 20 mils will be the default trace width for those nets. And there you have it. By following these tips for component placement and using the rule system effectively, I'm pretty sure even your auto router will thank you. If, however, you're doing it manually, you'll have a much easier time routing clean, efficient, and professional-grade PCBs. If you learned something new today, or if you have tips that work for you but were not covered in this video, let me know in the comments section below. If you found this tutorial useful, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.